Welcome back to the class. Uh, as you know, we have been uh, having a detailed discussion about uh, subaltern studies as a very important uh, intervention in the debate about historiography of studying Indian experience and specifically that of uh, colonialism. We looked at uh, two uh, essays, one by Divya Chakravarti and uh, another by uh, Gyan Prakash. And uh, today uh, we are having two sessions where we look at the major critics uh, raised by other scholars against this whole project. While uh, subaltern studies was seen as a very important and valuable intervention, uh, it was also subjected to a lot of criticism, especially from the Marxist scholars. Basically, uh, you know, on, on, on various grounds and we will look into uh, all these criticisms in, in, in detail. So, uh, I have uh, with me uh, Mr. Dayal Paleri. Uh, who is a PhD scholar at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences to engage uh, these two, uh, this particular uh, section on uh, critics of subaltern studies. So, he will have uh, two sessions uh, looking into uh, a, a series of scholars, mostly from uh, the Marxian school and, and, and he will explain what were the kind of a major uh, ideological, uh, theoretical and uh, methodological criticisms, uh, uh, you know, raised by these scholars. So, over to uh, Dayal. Uh, good morning all of you. So, uh, in, today, in, in uh, this session, we will be dealing with the critics of subaltern studies. Professor Sandosh has already talked in extensively about uh, subaltern studies as, 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 as a distinct school of theory that emerged in, in the global south in the 1980s and uh, he has also presented the central tenets of subaltern studies, uh, it is how it acts actually influenced a host of disciplinary movements across South Asia, why even though subaltern studies started as a distinct school or intervention in, in the discipline of history, he has already talked how it has influenced a wide range of disciplines such as anthropology, literature, political science and so on. Uh, so, today uh, we will be dealing with uh, what are the certain critics that emerged uh, against subaltern studies, one of the critical engagement with subaltern studies by various scholars. So, uh, before we go into details of the critics of subaltern studies, I want you to have a look at uh, the, the, the kind of genealogy of subaltern studies. So, as we, as you might be familiar, subaltern studies has 12 volumes of, uh, it has published as 12 volumes. The first one edited by Ranajit Guha, the founder of the subaltern studies in 1982 and the last one uh, uh, came in the year 2005 edited by Shail Mayaram, MSS Pandian and Ajay Skarya. So, between this year, almost a gap of 25 years, there have been 12 volumes of subaltern studies has been, uh, has been uh, published and uh, the first four volumes have been published by Ranit Guha. So, we will look at the contents, contents of the, uh, few of the subaltern studies volume in order to give a sense of the genealogy of subaltern studies because the critics of subaltern studies has more or less been uh, focused on how subaltern studies has been transformed over the years. So, let us look at the first uh, uh, sections it has been edited by uh, Ranaji Guha. So, what you will see is that the, the themes of all these chapters as overarchingly focused on peasantry, right. So, there is this uh, article on agrarian relations in Bengal by Partha Chatterjee, Shahid Amin's article on small peasantry. Similarly, uh, uh, there was an article on peasant revolt in Avadh by Gyan Pandey. Uh, so, and, and, and if you look at the second volume which published in the next year, again edited by Ranaj Guha, you can also see similar kind of themes mostly focusing on peasant or tribal revolt in colonial India, right agrarian change, agricultural workers or on conditions of the working class, on peasantry. So, as Professor Sandosh has already talked about, peasantry was an important uh, thematic analytical uh, theme, not just as a class, it is also an analytical uh, purchase for the subaltern studies. So, now let us look at the later volumes of the subaltern studies. You have here the seventh uh, volumes of subaltern studies. Uh, and if you look at uh, the, the, the various chapters, you will see a decisive shift in the subjects of, of, of the various articles published. You can see an article on the Calcutta middle class, uh, there is on community emerges as a very important term and you know, li li the, the, the how the state has 
dealt with uh, you know how the legal systems in the colonial era has come up as a very important theme and you also have the final volumes of subaltern final volume of subaltern studies published uh, in 2003 it is even titled uh, you know as muslim dalits and fabrication history you can see the idea of peasantry is completely absent you know it or it has evolved from that you have on refiguring the fanatic which is primarily on the mapla muslims of malabar on representing the musliman on uh, caste on indian modernity you know on there is something on uh, on on uh, gender a study by pravina kodoth and you know yeah so so what i wanted to show you through this is that uh, there is a decisive shift in the themes that subaltern scholarship has increased uh, from its first volume in 1983 to the final volume in 2005 and this genealogy the shift is very central in understanding the certain critics of subaltern studies so as we already uh, discuss subaltern studies as emerged as a very important uh, school of thought within the global south you know the the knowledge paradigms in social science that are already being critic it is overarchingly dominated by the global north or the western academia in that context subaltern studies emerged as a very important and original school of thought in the global south and and its its influences has gone beyond history it has influenced sociological uh, thinking it has influenced anthropological scholarship also uh, on literature on sexuality studies on gender and so on and so forth and and as we saw there is a growth from the conventional marxist language or the marxist paradigm that subaltern studies in the initial volume has been uh, focused on to more diverse uh, uh, subjects of inquiry such as gender on subjecthood on power in a very non marxist sense in a foucauldian sense and so on so this has been seen as a growth or even as a deviation by some critics that Uh, we will go in detail and and there has been multiple influences so the while the early influences has been decisively one sense of orthodox marxis marxism the later influences has been varied right it it, uh, the, it people like edward said scholarship michael fuko uh, gayatri spivak all of these became very influential uh, influential uh, elements in the later subaltern studies scholarship and as we saw subaltern studies has also had uh, immense impact on a global scale uh, as you already i have already mentioned edward said and gayatri spivak who are very uh, towering figures in the global indonesia in the north has taken has uh, introduced subaltern studies to a broader audience and it has also inspired similar movements from other parts of the global south such as the latin american subaltern studies collective that was founded in 1992 it has also inspired a similar uh, scholarship in in uh, in places like africa where were which also has similar uh, post colonial histories like the global south Glo- the south asia so the global s- the subaltern studies has a varied global influences so today in this session i'll be dealing with three important critics of subaltern studies the first one is uh, a scholar named javed alam Uh, who as uh, identi- morally identifies with a conventional uh, marxist uh, intellectual paradigm in india indian context uh, he uh, primarily taught in himachal pradesh university and later in the english and foreign language university who was also a very important uh, figure in, in 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 indian political science scholarship at one point of time uh, so he uh, and his critique of subaltern studies came uh, soon after the first volume was published so it was an initial critique and it was published in the left leaning uh, journal called the social scientist so those who are interested uh, should go and read it in detail and there is also a uh, long engagement that follows uh, javed alam's article uh, some of the subaltern scholars uh, subalt- some of the scholars uh, associated with the subaltern studies collective has also uh, uh, engaged with javed alam's critics in detail so i strongly recommend you to go and uh, read it in full the debate in full so the second uh, uh, critic that i am dealing uh, is by sumit sarkar and it's very important because sumit sarkar uh, he was part of the founding collective of the subaltern studies uh, himself uh, but he left the subaltern studies after nine early 1990s and then he wrote a critique which actually 
uh, elaborately detailed the reason why he left and also his critiques or his, he also his critique or dissatisfaction with the way the subaltern studies has gone in 1990s he will go in details about the trajectory of subaltern studies so the genealogy of the subaltern studies scholarship and we have another uh, and sumal sarkar is a historian himself so we have uh, javed alam who is a political scientist who critiques subaltern studies soon after the first volume came out and we have sumit sarkar who was part of the collective but became a dissenting voice and he is a historian himself who has made this critique on a midway of subaltern studies uh, evolution and we have a third critic by vivek chibba who is a sociologist in new york university uh, who has then presented a very book length critique of subaltern studies after 5 or 8 years after the final volumes of subaltern studies came up but he uh, was i mean even after subaltern studies uh, stopped or the final volume came out it has been a lingering influences in the in the scholarship in various field in south asia so vivek chibbar uh, presented a very a book length critique of subaltern studies uh, and uh, also from a broad marxist paradigm so even javed alam sumit sarkar vivek chabar subscribes to a, a different strands in marxist scholarship so all these cri three critics broadly uh, belong to the marxist uh, paradigms and as i said this was a diverse uh, sense of disciplines three of them bring comes from three different disciplines and also three different uh, time periods of pertaining to the subaltern studies scholarship so uh, that's why we will kind of discuss these three as a representative of the subaltern studies critic there are obviously other critic which i will uh, mention in the course of time so oh, and subjects and and the objects of the criticism has also been different some of them critic the foundational idea of subaltern studies while sumit sarkar was morely more interested in the deviations of this founding concept vivek chibber on the other hand dealt with the larger consequences of subaltern studies on similar scholarship uh, in in post on post colonial scholarship in general in in different disciplines so first we will uh, go in detail uh, about uh, javed alam's uh, work which is titled as peasantry politics and historiography critique of new trends in relation to marxism so uh, from the title itself is very similar very very uh, uh, familiar that subaltern studies is being seen as an intervention in historiography within the marxist paradigm so it's it's as some of the subaltern studies themselves called they seems to have they they uh, presented themselves as marxism uh, with a difference marxism that is being more attentive to the idea of difference in post colonial society so javed alam's critiques is is also premised on the idea that uh, subaltern studies is a, a descending voice within marxist tradition so that is the broader premise of his critique okay Uh, so javed alam takes an issue with one of the central uh, theoretical concept of subaltern studies which is the idea of subaltern autonomy right so as you might know that there are some key concept that is very central to subaltern studies one is uh, the idea of elite and then there is an idea of the subaltern right and one of the key argument that subaltern studies put forward is that the elite and the subalterns occupy two domains of production and therefore two domains of power or politics right and this is came, came as a critique of other forms of historiography which did not made this bifurcation or the distinction of elite and subaltern as two domains of power or production right there is this colonial historiography or or the mainstream nationalist historiography which was overarchingly focused on the how the broader process of colonialism uh, was influencing both the elite and the subaltern in india and how the anti colonial movement or the national movement comprised of the both the elite and subaltern so they were not very uh, uh, aware or very uh, interested or very much interested in the distinction between the elite and the subaltern in the indian context they did not make such an analytical distinction between them while on the other hand you have marxist historians who were interested in analytical separation between the the bourgeois or the bourgeois elite in the indian context and the working class and the peasantry in the indian context but even then they did not treat them 
uh, as occupying two distinct domains of power they they found that there is a relational uh, there is a rela power relation between the elite and subaltern and the subaltern in the marxist even though the marxist did not use the term subaltern they used working class or peasantry as such and they were insisting that both the peasantry and the working class were continuously influenced or or even resisting so influenced by the ideas that coming from both the national elite as well as the colonial elite so they also did not they were also not interested in such a conceptual bifurcation between the elite and the subaltern so it is in that context were subaltern studies emerged and they said all this uh, scholarship of historiography has treated uh, the peasantry primarily the peasantry has the objects of history their voice is not being heard right because there is an and they also said the, the peasantry in indian uh, india during the colonial thing was not interested in the colonial project as well as in the anti national anti colonial project by the indian elites because they occupied a different or an autonomous sphere of politics their consciousness the subjectivity was different the concern their interest was different right and 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 the, the neither the marxist nor the national historiography did not record treat this peasant autonom peasant as an autonomous subjects they were never made the subjects of history but made passive objects of the larger projects such as colonialism capitalism or nationalism so they were only treated as a passive subjects of this larger projects they were never treated as active subjects they were uh, active subjects of their own history so this is the the, the central thesis or central idea of subaltern studies therefore the subaltern autonomy then occupies a central uh, a central place in 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 subaltern historiography and this is with this central idea that javed alam has an issue so he will go and elaborate that this central idea of subaltern autonomy is a flawed concept it is not empirically valid this is one of the first this is the core or the meat of javed alam's history so he then went on to uh, quote Uh, he went on to quote or reproduce the presupposition of subaltern study he says the subaltern study is presupposes that between the world of politics on the one hand and the economic process of capitalist transformation on the other on this on the world of production and politics there is a kind of mental space within which the social forms of existence and the consciousness of the people are all uh, their own as strong and enduring on their own right and therefore free of manipulations by the dominant group so both in the dom uh, domain of pr production and in domain of politics the subaltern occupies an autonomous space right they are not they are not being manipulated uh, by the elite neither by the colonial or the national elite so this is a central thing so uh, and 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 this in turn extended as a critique of the or the orthodox marxist or imperialist or nationalist historiography so this so javed alam presents this is a presupposition of of subaltern studies and then he went on to interrogate this idea of autonomy so he says what is the empirical roots of this conception of subaltern autonomy and it look, looks at each chapters of the first volume you have to remember that subal uh, javed alam's volume published soon after the first volume so he he is only being uh, you know interrogating the chapters available to the first volume and we have we have al already had a quick look at the first volume mostly about various peasant uprising in uh, colonial india and he says the subaltern studies treat this sporadic peasant uprising as an empirical basis of the uh, subaltern autonomy and he says as javed alam went on to say that such sporadic resistance is common to all kind of societies it com common to archaic pre modern or modern societies whenever there is an issue of exploitation or oppression but if you have to and javadalan says but to infer from the fact that such sporadic upsurges that uh, you know is autonomous from the elite domain of politics or the broader national uh, domain of politics is is a highly questionable presupposition and he says uh, and javadalan went on to say that there is a discrepancy there is a difference or there is a tension between the idea of subaltern autonomy and the empirical uh, basis that or empirical cases that is being presented by the first volume of subaltern studies and then javed alam then went on to say that 
if you are to look at some peasant politics or peasant uprising, uh, Alam then went on to present a detailed alternative history, history of some of the cases that is being presented or he uses the material that is being presented by the subaltern studies themselves, but draws a different conclusion from it. I am not going into the details of it, but I will just present the argument and he says, if you look at the particular cases, the pe peasant militancy is neither completely subordinate to the national elite interest or the colonial elite interest nor completely autonomous. So, there is a dialectical relation between them. So, that is what uh, Javed Alam presents an alternative. You cannot treat peasantry as completely autonomous from the national or colonial elite or the broader structural changes uh, happening uh, through the process of colonialism or capitalism, but uh, or you have to see uh, them as completely passive subjects. Right. He agrees with uh, uh, the subaltern studies that the peasantry are not or, or are completely passive. He agrees with that, but he does not uh, agree with the claim that they are completely autonomous. He, he says there is element of both in it. So, there is and he says in the peasant consciousness, in the mental space of the peasantry or in the peasant subjectivity, it is a very contradictory subject. It has elements of both it has elements of subordination as well as elements of autonomy. And, uh, and Javed Alam went on to uh, present another problematic of this idea of subaltern autonomy. He says in the scheme of subaltern studies, they are not very concerned with the direction of the peasant uprising takes, they are only con concerned or they are only concerned with the question is that whether uh, the sporadic action or the militancy of the peasantry is autonomous or not, right? The historical direction is not very important. So, there is a link what so Javed Alam asks this counter question or counter indicative question. So, what do you call or characterize a peasant uprising that takes a communal form? And there are a number of examples in the colonial India. There is a lot of and, and, and if you look at if you look at one of uh, many of uh, scholarship by some of the subaltern scholars like Gyanendra Pandey himself who talked about how colonialism uh, or colonialist actually uh, uh, fueled the, pro the, the construction of uh, a, 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 a rigid uh, a Hindu and Muslim identities which in turn fueled uh, a lot of inter communal violence in India. Uh, so, there is a clear connection with what happening on a broader elite sphere such as colonial policies and the subjects of the, ma the Indian mass be the peasantry or the working class, right. So, Javed Alam asks, what if the peasant uprising takes a communal colour? Are the subaltern studies will still call them as a subaltern uprising? So, that question is that kind of uh, questions are not being clearly answered in the subaltern studies schema. So, that is, so he, he argues that the subaltern studies are not very clearly concerned about the historical direction that the peasant uprising takes and and he says that is why there is a need for more conceptual precisions on the idea of subaltern autonomy. When in what cases uh, can you call a subaltern or a peasant uprising as autonomous, in what cases you cannot call it right. Are all this peasant uprising as already uh, always autonomous? So, this is the question that Javed Alam ask and, and he says whenever can you call a peasant uprising as autonomous, whenever it takes a deviant form from the bourgeois national elite uh, suppose, right. He says, is it simply synonymous with a situation of asymmetry between uh, the limited calculations of the elites of the bourgeois nationalist leadership and the radical stirring of the exploit and oppressed class. So, whenever, uh, whenever there is a discrepancy with, with what the bourgeois national leadership want or the peasant act, can you call it as uh, autonomous, whatever be the historical direction of the peasant uprising. So, this is a central, this is one of the counter question that uh, Javed Alam ask. And, and he also ask, can you call a subaltern uh, uprising or a peasant uprising autonomous, if that move does not materially advance their own interest, right. He, he also then argues that subaltern studies is not very interested in the question of whether a sporadic action or a militancy of the peasantry actually advance the material interest of the peasantry themselves. So, he says then, then uh, uh, Javed Alam went on to present different counterfactual examples and says that there are instances 
when the, the bourgeois elites try to demobilize some of the peasant uprising successfully so if they were completely autonomous from the influences of the bourgeois national elite the, the, there should not be any cases where the national elite was successfully demobilized the peasant uprising right so if if subaltern consciousness or peasant consciousness is already always autonomous how do you explain such instances of demobilization of the peasant interest or peasant uh, uh, dissatisfaction by the national elite so then uh, then uh, javed alam also argues that in the subaltern study schema subaltern autonomy is exclusively located in a pre capitalist consciousness in that sense subaltern historiography is very close to the classical colonial anthropology which was always in a search for an original primitive unconquered exotic subject right if you are familiar with this problem of debate in anthropology anthropology was was decisively considered as, as a colonial discipline it was primarily used in indian context and other contexts as well in indian context particularly anthropology was a discipline that primarily used by the colonialist to enumerate to classify indian society into primitive and non primitive right? the the classical anthropologist uh, did lot of studies field work and enumerative studies and they were always in search for primitive tribes so anthropology in colonial india was primarily a study of the tribes and there has been uh, very critical scholarship available on that right they classified indians into uh, the degree of primitiveness so they were always in search of the exotic the real indians or indigenous communities in that sense and and javed alam then went on to argue that there are similarities with uh, such such drive in sir drive for finding the uh, unconquered autonomous or indigenous with the drive uh, of the subaltern studies so he find a very strange overlap between the colonial anthropology and subaltern studies uh, in 1980s and then he asked a very pertinent question that were the subaltern were really autonomous were the indian bourgeois the indian national leaders the elite of the indian national movement really failed to speak for the nation and he then says no actually the, the in since the 1920s since the arrival of the gandhi in the national movement Uh, the peasantry were overarchingly rallied behind gandhi and they were made part of the elite national project even though there were issues even though uh, gandhi or the mainstream national movement did not or were not very representative of the peasant interest as such uh, it is an empirical fact that the national movement the anti colonial movement has transformed from an exclusive elite movement of the international congress to a mass led movement in the 1920s Uh, there's a civil disobedient movement or the non cooperation movement or the kit india movement uh, were classical example of how mass it was in character not just in leadership it was also in character it was clearly mass based and there was a strong peasant support to this uh, to whatever uh, gandhi was advocating because gandhi was also uh, very much involved in various peasant movements of the time so javed alam says empirically this idea of The, that indian bourgeois he failed to speak for the nation is factually incorrect and then uh, uh javed alam went on to construct a different paradigm to understand the kind of relation that indian peasantry had with the indian uh, bourgeois or colonial elite he says it is rather than the subaltern being uh, already always uh, autonomous what the actual mechanism at place was an alliance of the bourgeois landlord interest right and this is a very uh, a very uh, significant uh, conceptual schema that javed alam pose as an alternative to the idea of subaltern autonomy uh, javed alam says the, the idea of peasantry cannot be seen as a, as a uniform homogeneous category right there was huge landlords within peasantry there are people who own a uh, huge number of land and who has who also come from a dominant upper caste communities and there are small peasantry who are predominantly in the middle or the lower caste or even there are agriculture or agrarian workers who are being part of it uh, but 
and when in in the in the scheme of subaltern studies when they classify uh, the whole of the population as elite and subaltern they misses this internal differences within the peasantry or within what they constitute as a subaltern and then javadalam says not everyone in the subaltern have the or same or similar material interest and he says there are landlords within the subalterns and you know the small peasantry or the rest of the, the peasantry and he says whenever the bourgeoisie uh, failed to ha have dominance or hegemony over over the large class of the subalterns or the peasantry they made an alliance with the peasant uh, landlords what he calls the bourgeois landlord alliance right so whenever the bourgeoisie failed to speak uh, for the whole uh, speak fee speak uh, for the peasantry or the subaltern whenever the bourgeois interest were not resonant with the peasantry's interest the bourgeois is then made alliances strategic alliances with the landlords and in that sense it was only the landlords who were autonomous not the whole subaltern it was landlords only the landlords within the peasantry were autonomous who were able to advance their own material interest you know so and and javadalam argues that subaltern studies miss completely misses the strategic alliance between the bourgeois and landlords and and this is uh, an alternative scheme that javadalam presents and and javadalam went on to further argues that this autonomy of the landlords is also not a permanent condition it's also conditional to the structures or the forces of the capitalism how the bourgeoisie expand himself so even even the landlord autonomy is not a permanent or a given condition it is conditional to the imperative of the the form that capitalism takes place in indian context or in the colonial context yeah and then he says in the instance of lacking hegemony bourgeois rule is always a case of infirm capitalism riding on what is feudal so the the feudal structure in which the peasantry uh, is an important class continues only when the bourgeoisie decides so only when they want it to so so they will have an alliances with the landlords interest and that's when how the the, the landlordism continues within the broader context of colonial capitalism there are a lot of examples that we know the how uh, the, the colonial bourgeoisie has made decisive compromises with the, the, the landlords for example in the case of if you are familiar with the case of malabar rebellion is an it's an instance when Uh, the colonial bourgeoisie uh, has has made uh, tactical uh, alliances with the upper caste landlords and therefore the peasant uprising was against both the colonial state against the colonial bourgeoisie as well as the native landlords right so you have to see the whole of the peasantry as undifferentiated categories so you so that is what uh, javadalam uh, says what subaltern studies are actually missing and he says in the original gramscian schema we know that subaltern studies takes the idea of subaltern uh, predominantly from gramsci antonio gramsci an italian marxist and they are they are in indebted to uh, gramsci as the intellectual predecessor of subaltern studies but in the original gramscian schema subaltern resistance is uh, is sporadic but they are always subjected to the activity of the ruling group their autonomy is not already given so the subaltern autonomy is a goal right autonomy is attained only when they are permanently transcend the existing socio economic relations of power so in the gramscian sense subalterns or peasantry are not already always autonomous their resistance is to attain that sense of autonomy but on the other hand in the subaltern studies there is a reversal of the idea of autonomy because autonomy is already been uh, conceptualized as present or given our inherited condition they are not very interested in in looking at subaltern subaltern consciousness as contradictory consciousness or having both elements of autonomy and subjugation they are completely have a sanitized idea of subaltern autonomy or consciousness and conceptualize it is as already always given and javadalam has points out this is not logically or or this is not uh, a a faithful or a not a correct interpretation of gramscian idea of uh, subaltern autonomy and finally uh, javadalam also present there is a problem of conceptual eclecticism in subaltern studies meaning 
the subaltern studies has uh, drawn uh, various conceptual categories and then there is a problem of incoherence right because uh, they, they completely reject the conventional class categories of the Marxian schema such as upper class uh, or the ruling class and put the idea of elite versus the subaltern right. And secondly they also uh, instead of using uh, idea of uh, modes of productive relations and so on uh, subaltern scholarship is introduced an idea of modes of power. So, they talk about within a broader social system there are different modes of power coexistence. For example, there are modes of colonial power, there is a modes of feudal power and there is modes of communal power. So, there are different kinds of power that coexist power uh, in the sense there are communal power, there are feudal power the and there is bourgeois power in the capitalist system. And but there, there is no analytical schema that distinguish or that talks about the internal relations within uh, these modes of power, right. So, modes of power is being used in a very descriptive term as we talk about modes of dress or modes of transport transportation and so on. There is no, uh, there is no analytical uh, dis uh, framework that, that tells you much more about how are these different modes of power interact each other or what is the kind of internal relation between the modes of power. So, this is the problem of a conceptual eclecticism in subaltern studies that Javadalam raises. Uh, so, it is the he, he particularly points out Partha Chatterjee's work as an example of such conceptual eclecticism and, and that is what he names Partha Chatterjee's uh, specific articles as, as a as an example of, of this problem of conceptual ex exploitation. So, finally, uh, he also says this idea of this problem of conceptual exploitation also leads to another problem that is a the subaltern studies has a very static idea of power instead of a relational idea of power. This also is related to the initial point of subaltern autonomy, right. When, when you can when you conceptualizes two domains of power the elite and uh, the subaltern you uh, you treat them as very essential categories you do not understand uh, the difference or the kind of relations how interaction between these uh, two domains takes place right or how this how, how what are the internal differences between uh, both these categories or, or how, how do they relate to each other. You do not see elite in relation to subaltern or you see subaltern in relation to elite, but you see them are autonomous right. So, that produce a very static idea of power. However, uh, uh, Javed Alam concludes uh, that uh, uh, sub, uh, with notwithstanding all this criticism, the problem of uh, the, 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 this empirical, the, non, the, the problem of the empirical basis of the subaltern autonomy or the problem of conceptual uh, eclecticism that subaltern studies holds. Despite of all this, uh, sub subaltern studies is a very important intervention in, in within the broad Marxist historiography, but it is completely and he treats as a complete deviation from the dominant form of Marxism that is rooted in the Lenin Mao tradition of agrarian question. And Javed Alam says, it is more or less similar to an an another uh, non conventional academic Marxism su such as the Frankfurt School. If you are familiar with the origin of Frankfurt School that emerged in Germany in 1930s or 1920s uh, as a descender of the kind of Marxism that the Soviet Union uh, was propagating. So, he, he compared is a uh, school of academic Marxism whose empirical basis are questionable. So, this is uh, broadly what uh, Javed Alam. So, you have to understand that Javed Alam's critics come from a more or less an orthodox rebuttal of subaltern studies or a defense because subaltern studies emerged as a Marx intervention within Marxism as a descender within. So, this this um, Javed Alam's intervention can be seen as a defense of the orthodox idea of Marxist historiography against uh, subaltern studies. So, we will stop uh, this session today and the next session we will do two other uh, important critics of subaltern studies. Thank you.